Hey, hey, hey! It's Time Machine Teacher here. And we have the big exam tomorrow. So I'm hoping you guys will hop on here and we can do a quick review to see if you have any questions. Let's see, where are you at? Okay. To see if you have any questions. So I'll just wait and see if some viewers come on here. And if you get logged on, just make a comment over here uh, or down there in the comments to let me know that you're here. And we'll get started here in a little bit looking over the exam. Who's ready for the AP exam tomorrow? I'm excited. I think you guys can do it. I know you're ready. All right, so if you just are logging on to this, make sure you uh, make a comment. Let me know you're here. All right. Okay, we got the big AP exam. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, excited? All right, I see we got some viewers on here. Make sure you make a comment. Let me know that you're here, and we'll get started here in just a second talking about the overview of the exam and the layout and what you need to expect when you walk into that room tomorrow. How's everybody doing today? Okay. <clears throat> All right, don't forget to comment. Let me know where you're from, especially if you're not one of my West Side students. Let me know where you're from and we'll get started here. Okay. All right, so you have the big AP exam tomorrow and I know all of you have been preparing all year for it. Hey, Naomi. Hold on, let me see if I can get you up here on the screen. I've got this uh, new technology. Oh, there you are. There you are. How's it going, Naomi? Where are you from? And I got Amanda W. Don't be nervous. You got this. You can do it. Where are you from, Amanda? You one of my West Side kiddos? All right, make sure and comment. Let me know you're here and we'll get started here in just a second. We'll look over the overview of the exam and if you have any last minute questions, I'm here to help you. All right. So let's get started and if you have questions, just go ahead and put them in the comments and I will answer them as they come up. Uh, I'm the Time Machine Teacher. If you've been watching my videos, I really appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do that before you get off of this live video. I really appreciate it. Let's see. Yep, remember Frizzy? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. I know who you are. All right, sweet. Well, welcome, Amanda. Uh, I'm so glad you're here. Let's get started. Let's look at the uh, exam and um, what we can expect from the overview. Okay, so remember, you're going to start out with 55 multiple choice questions. The most important thing with your multiple choice questions is that you go as quickly as possible. Now, remember, you only have 55 minutes for these 55 multiple choice questions. That's like one minute a question. So you're probably not gonna get finished. When you get towards the end, make sure that you're filling in and that you're guessing. Don't leave any of those blank because it's better to guess and get them wrong than it is to have all of them blank, okay? So make sure that you do that. So keep an eye on the time. And if you get down to about where you got like five minutes left, Make sure you're filling in and guessing. Do you have any other questions about the multiple choice before we move on to the essays? Any other questions? All right, pretty much multiple choice. You just gotta do your best, go as fast as you can, and, uh, and fill them in as, as, you, get, as you get them through. Uh, anybody, uh, can everybody hear me? I forgot to ask to make sure that the volume was good. This is my first live, so it's a little bit different than doing you know, the edited videos that I've been putting out. So just comment over there on the side, make sure that uh, I can hear you or that you can hear me. That'd be great. Okay. All right. So after you get done with the multiple choice, 
you are going to have four, uh, you will have four short answer questions. You only have to answer three. If you have time, then go ahead and answer that fourth one, but you're probably gonna be crunched for time. So make sure that you read over them and that you're answering the ones that you can do the best job on, okay? Also, very important with the short answers. If there is a picture or if there is a primary document, make sure that you reference that document or that picture, especially if they ask you to do that. All right, let's see, we got Yasmin. Yasmin says, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, thank you Yasmin for letting me know, I appreciate that. All right, so back to the short answers. If there's an image, a map, anything that is related to that that you're supposed to use to answer it, make sure that you talk about it in your response, all right? Very, very important, or you won't get that point. Now remember, each short answer is worth three points. You get one point for each part that you write, so A, B, C. Make sure you label A, B, and C. Make sure you have a topic sentence, so use that prompt to reword and make it into your topic sentence, okay? Now, if it has a, uh, if it has a picture or a map or something like that, and it doesn't ask you to use it, then you don't necessarily have to address it in your short answer. But pay attention to the wording of the prompt so that you're answering it correctly. Also, very important with SAQ is make sure that you're answering the actual prompt with vocab, okay? Use as many vocab in there as you can. We did a practice one in class. Remember the one about the tributary system? I think most of you guys at Westside did it. So that one, you wanna have like words like cowtow and nomads and tributary system, all those key vocab words that go with your topic. Make sure you put those in there. All right, Amanda says, what periods do you think might be questioned more or you happen to not be able to answer, uh, answer that? Okay, so the periods that are gonna be questioned more are periods three through six. Periods one and two will pretty much only be on the multiple choice. None of the essays usually cover periods one or two, so periods three through six are the most important. That pretty much starts at the end of the Mongols and goes all the way up to present day, all right? So those are gonna be your most important ones that you're going to need to remember. Good, good answer, or good question there, Amanda. Okay, so that's a short answer. Anybody have any other questions about the short answers before we go on to long essay? All right, so the long essay, remember that one is going to be the one that they'll give you a prompt Usually they give you two or three prompts to choose from, so I would suggest reading all of them and seeing which one you can answer the best, and then going with that one, all right? Once again, if you have some sort of a primary document or you have a picture to go with that, uh, that question, make sure you address it in your long essay question, all right? Also, make sure that you have your thesis. Now, very important with your thesis, all right? You have to have in your thesis what you're going to talk about in the essay. So let's say that there is a prompt that says that you need to compare and contrast the revolutions, all right? And your choices are French, American, Haitian, all the revolutions. So you choose French and American. Are you gonna put in your thesis the similarities and differences between um, French and American Revolution are several, or there are several similarities and differences between the French and American Revolution. Is that a thesis? No, that's not a thesis because you're not telling the reader exactly what you're gonna be talking about. So you need to make sure that you put those similarities and differences that you're gonna be talking about in your thesis, okay? Very important or you won't get that point. Okay, let's see what you say here. Uh, so. You asked, um, I haven't really studied periods four through six, and my exam is tomorrow. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> well, um, you can check out my periods four through six review. That would be helpful. I have review videos for each one of those periods on the Time Machine Teacher channel, so go ahead and check those out before you go to bed tonight. But other than that, it's really too late to do any intensive studying. Make sure that you're not staying up all night, all right? Sleep is super important before you go into the exam. So if you want to cram a little bit, just watch those videos real quick, maybe take some notes, pay attention to the vocab words, 
and then just do your best. I mean, at this point, you really can't like study super intensely, but you can definitely review a little bit. All right. Uh, okay, so anyway, back to the long essay. Make sure in your thesis that you're putting those similarities and differences, you're putting the changes and continuities, or you're putting the cause and effect, whatever that prompt asks you for, you put it into your thesis, okay? Everybody got that? That's super important. Then what you're gonna do with that thesis is you're gonna break it down into topic sentences. So let's say one of your similarities between the French and American Revolution is that they both started because the people were uh, upset with taxes. Let's say that's one of your similarities. That could be your first topic sentence. And then you're gonna make that into a paragraph, right? Within that paragraph, you're gonna put your evidence and you're gonna put your support. So evidence would be like vocab words that have to do with that. Maybe talking about the third estate. Why the third estate was so upset with taxes was because they were paying the majority of those taxes, right? And then you can compare it to the American colonists of how they didn't have representation in government. You can talk about how the third estate didn't have enough rep representation in government either. All right. That's your evidence and support kind of all wrapped up into one. Then you're going to go on with your second similarity or difference and your third similarity or difference. All right. Don't forget on the LEQ, you still need context. So put context in there. What's context? Well, I told my kids to remember context is what is going on in the entire world at that time that affects your topic, all right? So what other revolutions are going on? Well, you can talk about uh, why the revolutions even started. Remember, the taxes are raised on the American colonists because of the French and Indian War. So you can tie that into context. All right, and Skylar just said, how do you contextualize? Well, that's what we were just talking about. So. Contextualization is what is going on in the whole wide world. You know that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. You know that song? Well, you could say you've got the whole wide world in contextualization. Okay, that's an easy way to remember it. It's kind of goofy, but you know, that's all right. So you've got the whole world in contextualization. So what is going on that's causing these revolutions? If we were going to contextualize for a French and American, which is the example I gave you for the LEQ, we would talk about the Enlightenment, all right? We would talk about Voltaire and John Locke and how they are starting to question whether or not monarchies are really the way to go. And that because of the Enlightenment, it's starting to get people in America and people in France to think about things a little bit differently. So that would be your context of these revolutions. Now, if you were talking about the Haitian Revolution, your context would be the French Revolution. Right? Because the French Revolution kind of inspires the Haitian Revolution. So when you're thinking about context, think of like the first chapter of a book or prologue. What is happening that's setting all of those events in motion? All right, so Amanda says, so background information to explain why it even happened. Exactly, Amanda, that's exactly right. Background information to explain why it happened. What is the cause of all of this? And what sets it up? Very good, that's cont contextualization. Now remember, contextualization is only one point. So if you get on the LEQ or the DBQ and you're like, I have no idea what happened before this, then just skip it and go on. Don't sit there and waste your time stressing about it because you're gonna need that time to continue writing the rest of the points, okay? If you do know though, make sure and write it. Also, if you have time, you can contextualize at the beginning or the end. So if you want to, if you have time, you can kind of like contextualize at the beginning and then reword it at the end just to make sure that if that first part wasn't good enough for the person who's reading your exam, maybe that last part will get them. Maybe you'll add in some stuff or maybe you'll think of some things as you're writing the essay, all right? So that's your LEQ. And of course, the LEQ has that last point in it, that unicorn point, which is given and awarded for really, really good essays. So you just want to try to write as strong of an essay as possible to try to get that point. All right, then last but not least, you have your DBQ. Your DBQ is worth more than the LEQ. So make sure that you're absolutely going to write that DBQ. Don't skip the DBQ, all right? DBQ is all about the documents. You're gonna first contextualize, all right? Then you're gonna write your thesis. 
how do we write our thesis for the DBQ? It's a little bit different because you've got documents incorporated into this, right? So the first thing I always tell my students is to put your documents into groups. Remember, you can draw like little buckets, okay? And you're trying to find similarities within those documents. So let's say those documents all had to do with causes of the Haitian Revolution. Let's say that was the topic of your DBQ. So what you want to do in those documents is try to find things that those documents can prove that are similar. So maybe I've got two documents that are very similar that can prove something and that's what I'm going to put in that bucket. And then the next bucket will be other documents that are similar. And the next bucket will be other documents that are similar. Do you need more than one document in a bucket? Not necessarily. You can have one document that stands by itself. But your argument is going to be stronger if you can find two or three documents to use in that paragraph. Okay. Once you have your buckets, make sure you label the buckets with what the topic is. And then you can use those three topics for your thesis. You just throw those all together into a thesis sentence. Each one of those buckets will then become a paragraph. All right. Also for your DBQ, don't forget you have to do three things with those documents. The first thing you have to do is describe your document. Then you have to support and then you have to, uh, what's it called, explain. Explain, that's your last thing. And I got one of my students from last year, St. Mark, still remembers taking this test last year. Thank you for tuning in, St. Mark. How you doing? I hope you're well. Did you have to take any AP tests this year? I hope, you, I hope you're doing good. You have to stop by the learning commons and uh, let me know how you're doing. I haven't seen you for a little while. All right, so anyway, back to the DBQ. The first thing you're going to do is describe the document. That is simply saying the main idea of the document. So what is this document all about? All right, that's the easiest one. You have to do that three times. You can do it more than three times if you want. Then you're going to support or pull something from that document. Now the important thing on this one is to remember that you should not just put it in quotation marks. You have to reword it. So you're pulling something from the document that's going to prove your argument. What's your argument? Your argument is going to be the topic sentence. Okay, so whatever your topic sentence is, whatever that group of the bucket was, that's your topic sentence and that's what you're pulling. You got to pull something from the document, reword it, and support that topic sentence. And the very last thing is explaining the document. That's where you do point of view, you do audience, or you do purpose, all right? And Amanda was just saying, don't forget point of view and the audience, y'all. Yes, that is a point. That is a point, yes, you're right. Now, this is super important though, because it's only a point if you do it right, okay? So let me explain how you do it right. For point of view, you need to ask yourself the question, who is the author, what does the author believe, and why does the author believe it? Those are three questions that you need to ask yourself, all right? Remember, point of view is not what the author believes, it's why they believe it, okay? For example, if that person is really, really religious, then religion is definitely going to affect point of view. If you're a religious person, you're going to have a different opinion than someone who is not religious, okay? So you can say that the point of view or the author believes that slavery is bad because he is a religious person and he does not think it's right in the eyes of God, all right? So you're telling why that person believes it based on the document. So when you're reading through your documents for the first time, Look for people who are religious because it's super easy to do point of view on that one and mark it on your document. Look for women who might be talking about men or men who might be talking about women because clearly they, they have a different point of view. A man, come on, let's face it, men, you know nothing about how women think, right? Can I get a thumbs up on that one from you guys? So I'm sure that's the truth, right? You don't know the, our point of view. And this, it's the same vice versa. We don't know your point of view, all right? So gender definitely plays a part in point of view. Also, um, socioeconomic status. How rich or poor are they? If it's a rich man talking about the status of poor people, he doesn't get it. All of that is point of view, all right? So make sure you answer who is the author, 
What do they believe and why do they believe it? That's super important, okay? Then for audience, you're asking yourself, who is the audience and why is it important to the document that I know who the audience is, okay? What is, how is that relevant to the document? For example, uh, we read a document that was written by um, some uh, anti-colonialist uh, people in Africa who were like trying to get the British out, right? They're obviously going to be very persuasive because they're trying to talk to uh, pe African people. Well, I think it was, I can't remember exactly, I think it was South Africa. They're trying to talk to um, their people that to get them to join the movement, right? So they're going to be persuasive. And that has to do with the document because it's going to be worded more persuasively in the document. It might be exaggerated a little bit, all right? So that's audience. And then the last one is purpose. So why was it written and why is that important to the document, all right? Once again, purpose is a little bit like audience because if it's meant to persuade, then that's important because it might be exaggerated. Make sure you're not saying the same thing because you won't get points for that if you're saying the same thing, okay? And you have to do that four times. I always tell my kids, do it six times just in case you get one wrong, okay? All right, St. Mark says, uh, yeah, I took AP Lang today and apes last week. Woo, St. Mark, you had a lot going on. I hope you did well. I'm sure you were, you were great. All right, and Ronnie says, how do you get the complexity point? That's a good question, Ronnie. That point is super difficult to get. For the most part, it's kind of like a unicorn point, okay? It's just kind of like if your essay is really, really good and really well written and really proves that argument, then that's when you get that point. There's really no way to ensure that you're going to get that point. You just have to try your best to do as best good as you can in making that argument. I wish there was more of a clear answer for that question, but as far as I know, I've talked to um, other people who go out and read the test, and that's kind of the answer they've given me. So um, just do your best, write as, as good as you can, and hopefully you will uh, rock that point as well. And Praven says, good luck, sophomores. Thank you, Praven. I appreciate that. They sure have been trying this year, and so I'm hoping for them that they, they do well. All right, and then Skylar says, what's the difference between Southeast Asia and East Asia? Well, location uh, for sure. And if you look at the map, let's see, let me, I don't know if I can show you a map on my screen. Maybe I can. I don't think I can. Let me see if you guys can see this on here or not. So Southeast Asia is going to be mostly like the uh, India down in the islands. I don't think I can show you my screen. Um, so if you Google it, it'll come up with a map. And then if you Google, oh, hold on. If you Google a map of East Asia, it will also show you that as well. Um, so East Asia is going to be more like the China region, a little bit higher than um, Southeast Asia. All right. So sorry, I couldn't I couldn't show you that on my screen. All right, and then we got, what are all the parts of POV and how do you write conclusions for LEQ and DBQ? Okay, so POV, once again, you need to make sure you're answering these questions. Who is the author? What does the author believe? And why does the author believe it? Okay, if you rewind this video a little bit once I post it, you'll be able to see a little bit more in depth. But those are the three questions that you always want to ask yourself for POV. Remember, point of view is outside of the document. It's something that is affecting the writer that he doesn't necessarily say in the document, like religion, gender, socioeconomic status, all the things that affect our opinion that are not necessarily seen or written in the document. So you wanna look in that little description above the document and see, is this person religious? Are they rich? Are they poor? What kind of, what kind of um, experience or uh, things that have happened in their life are affecting what they believe? And then as far as conclusions go, you really don't have to write a conclusion for an LEQ or DBQ. 
because it's different than an English essay. So you have to get out of that English mindset, right? For your DBQ, if you absolutely want to write a conclusion, and even for your LEQ, you can reword your thesis in hopes that if you don't get the point from the beginning part of the thesis, that maybe by rewording it, you'll do a better job, okay? You can also um, put the outside evidence for the DBQ. That's anything outside the documents that you can say about this, th your argument or about the topic of the documents. And you can put that in your conclusion. But as far as like a typical conclusion of, hey, now I'm gonna conclude my paper, you don't need to waste your time on writing that. So that part's good news, right? All right. Um, I'm not sure what you're wanting here, uh, Chidera. Reference another time period that demonstrates what, what do you need demonstrated? Which essay? What, tell me what you're talking about there. Um, so for the conclusion, you can compare it to another time period. Yes, that's, that's a part of the complexity point. If you want to try to do that, you can compare it to something else in a different time period, but you have to do that very well in order to get that point. Sometimes you might not have time for that, but you can definitely try that and do it in the conclusion. And Avery says, I'm ready to fail this test. Avery, come on now. A little bit of positive thinking. You can do it. At least try. At least try your hardest. That's all we can ask from you guys is to just try your hardest. It is a very difficult test, but just try and uh, and see how you do. And Skylar says, is there a difference between contextualization and outside evidence? Yes, there's a big difference. So contextualization is what is going on in the whole wide world. Remember, we talked about what is leading to the topic, okay? So uh, what leads to World War I? Okay, here's an example. Remember our, our acronym MAIN? Militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism? All of that would be context for World War I. All right, so if you're writing an essay and it's saying, hey, what's the, you know, your topic is World War I, you can talk about militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, and how that leads up to World War I. Okay, that's your context. Then your outside evidence could maybe be about trench warfare. It has to be though something that's not in the document. So let's say that trench warfare is not in any of your documents. You can use that as outside evidence and you can talk about how new technology is forcing the, uh, the armies to use trench warfare because if they didn't have trenches, all of them would be killed outright. Okay, so that's the difference between contextualization and outside evidence. I hope you understand that a little bit better now. And we got what happens if you score low? What does this test affect? This test really will not affect anything if you score low. Basically, what's going to happen is you just won't get college credit for the class. So the worst case scenario is that you have to take world history again in college. But that's the absolute worst case scenario. If you pass and you get a score of three, four, or five, depending on your college and what they require, then you don't have to take this class in college. But uh, at my school, we don't use it for a grade or anything. Are you at Westside, Terry? Is it Terria and Company? Um, let me know if you're at Westside. If you're someplace else, I, I really don't think that usually, typically, schools do not use this for a grade. Uh, at Westside, we use it to exempt from finals as well, but it doesn't matter what score that you get, you still get to exempt. All right, Amanda says, extra information about the topic you happen to have. What topic? Any topic? Like any time period? Or is there a specific one that you're looking for? All right, so those are the essays. SAQ, LAQ, DBQ. If you have any other questions about those, let me know. Uh, so just a real quick overview. Um, period, time periods one, and uh, that one is mostly Neolithic Revolution. Okay, uh, all right, sweet. So you are a West Side student, great. Um, so it will not affect your grade. We don't use it as a grade. And so just do your best. That's what we're asking from you. Just do your best and hopefully you will get a passing score so that you can uh, not have to take this again in college. Okay, so just a quick overview of your time periods. 
Time period one, it's only 5%, so that one's not gonna be on there very much. The basics from time period one, Neolithic Revolution. Remember, it's that, that transformation from hunting and gathering to, um, <laughs> to farming. It just went out of my brain. Hunting and gathering to farming. Remember, they were nomads. Now they're not anymore. They go into more of farming. Okay, and Sophia. Hey, Sophia, I missed you guys today. Uh, what are some key points that we should get out of period four? Okay, Sophia, I will get to that in just a second. Um, I meant to describe, let's see. Amanda says, I meant to describe the POV in a sentence. Okay, so to describe the POV in a sentence, remember you're answering the questions. Who is the author? What does the author believe? And why do they believe it? That why part is super important. Okay. Okay, so... Period one, only 5%. Big thing there is Neolithic Revolution. Also your river valley civilizations, okay? Remember, in the river valley civilizations, this is where we start to see social stratification. These big words you're gonna see sometimes in your prompts, okay? So social stratification is just a fancy word for now we have social structures and social classes in society. And that starts to happen because of farming and trying to get management we have a surplus of food and so now we have people that are freed up to be able to do other things like inventing and writing uh okay i will get to that um safavids all right i will get to that mr pearson when we get to that period just give me a second all right so and then we have period two period two is going to be about 15 percent period two gets a little bit more in depth with Rome and Greece. Let me get to that in my little notebook here. So period two will be about um, Rome and Greece and we have like Alexander the Great. Remember some keywords with him are the Hellenistic period. Okay, hold on, that's period one. Ah. We also have religions during this time frame. Remember we have like um, we have Christianity and Islam as religions and Hindu um, and Confucian and Taoism. Remember that Taoism, Confucianism, those are more philosophies, okay, than they are religions. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Just trying to give you a little bit of an overview. Oh, Buddhism and legalism. So. Remember that we get um, Buddha, Buddhism happening and then legalism is going to be in China and that is opposite of Confucianism, remember? So if there's any of these things that I mentioned that you're like, man, I have no clue. Just go back real quick and look those up before you go to bed tonight. Uh, so also in period two, we have the um, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, that's in India, okay? Um, then we have the Mauryan Empire. During the Mauryan Empire, that's when we see Ashoka with the rock edicts. Remember, he has the rock edicts that have the law on it. Um, and then um, we have the Gupta Empire. For Greece, remember that there are city-states in Greece, okay? City-states being that the, it's not this huge nation. Remember, they're separated because of the geography in Greece. So we have Athens and Sparta, and Athens is more cultural and Sparta is more militaristic, okay? Uh, we have Alexander the Great and Hellenism. And remember, as he's going across and building his empire, he's spreading Greek culture, and it kind of mixes in with Egyptian culture, Indian culture, and um, Middle Eastern culture. Okay, so that's important. And then we have period three. All right, Chidera, I'll get to your question in just a minute. So period three is going to um, go from 600 to 1450. And this is when we will see the Abbasids and the Umayyads. Those are going to be the Islamic caliphates. Those are important. We also have Manza Musa, remember the richest man. Um, and he's from Mali, and he goes on a Hajj, remember, and spreads all the money throughout um, his Hajj. Uh, we have the Mongols coming in. 
That's also important uh, in regards to the tributary system because remember, China had a tributary system in place that the nomads had to pay China tribute in order to keep a good relationship. And then when the Mongols come in and create the Yan Dynasty, the tributary system is no longer needed because remember, the Mongols are nomads. So they're not going to force the nomads to pay a tribute. Okay. Uh, let's see. Also, oh, very important. Rome falls in 476. And after that, it kind of goes into the Middle Ages in Europe. Remember where we see feudalism and manneralism? Feudalism and manneralism are a little bit different. Feudalism is that structure of serf, knight, nobles, and kings on top, right? Manneralism is more of the economic structure where they set up manners and you don't really have to leave the manor. Everything you need is there. Remember we have a cottage industry during that time and everyone is um, making their own products within that manor, within that village, okay? So that's the difference between that. Uh, we also have the Crusades during that time. The Crusades, one of the effects of the Crusades is that it starts to get Europeans out of Europe and they're starting to think, man, there's other stuff out here. We need to kind of branch out a little bit. Okay. Then uh, don't forget about Japan. Uh, let's see some things that you should know about Japan. Um, the Mongols try to attack, but they don't get anywhere because of the tsunamis that come in. Is it tsunamis? or Yeah, I think it was the tsunami that came in. There was a strong storm that w knocked them out. Don't forget about the, oh no, not tsunamis, typhoon. That's what it was. Typhoon, sorry. Uh, don't forget about the Bushido Code. That's the, with the samurais and uh, those are the same as the knights. Remember, those are the knights of Japan. So they're all about honor and um, respect. During this time period, we also have the rise of Islam. Okay, and then after Muhammad dies, the split between the, Sh the Sunni and the Shiites. Don't forget about the five pillars of faith for Islam. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything more. Okay, so then we get to the gunpowder empires. And this will help you, Mr. Pearson, because you were asking, what are the Safavids? So the gunpowder empires are the Ottoman, the Safavid, and the Mughal empires. Remember, the Ottoman is also known as the Turkish Empire. It's inspired by, inspired by Islam. It lasts until 1922, so it goes from 1301 to 1922. The Ottoman Empire, one thing that you need to remember about them is that um, they have the Janissary troops. Remember, the Janissaries are child slaves that they train into these like super awesome warriors. And the Janissaries had a lot of power at first. And they were even kicking sultans on and off the throne. Like they would put the sultan up that they wanted and they would kick the one off that they didn't. Eventually, the sultan is going to overthrow them because they don't like the fact that the Janissaries have so much power. Okay, so that's important with the Ottoman Empire. The Safavid Empire goes from 1501 to 1722. Okay, and... Um, Let's see. It begins to collapse when several Muslim religious groups emerge and gain control of the Persian territory. Okay? Um, because the Safavid dynasty is run by the Shah, S H A H, and um, they are practicing Shiites. They also will have conflicts with the Turkish and uh, the Turkish Sunnis and the Ottoman Empire. Yes. And then um, the Safavid dynasty is responsible for establishing strong political and religious system of the Shiites in Iran and Iraq today. So that's one of the effects of the Safavid empire. Then we have um, also uh, the fact that they suppressed minorities, uh, religious minorities, including um, Persian religions of Sufism. So you can 
kind of remembered that one for the Safavid. And then for the Mughal, the Mughal Empire goes from 1526 to 1748. And it is a Muslim branch of, of the empire in northern India. And let's see. It's, le it's founded by Babur, who is descended from Genghis Khan. That's kind of interesting. Um, eventually, um, Akbar the Great takes over. He tries to unify northern India, but uh, it doesn't really work. Um, and he tries to unify them under a faith called the Divine Faith, which kind of mixes Hinduism, Muslim, and Christianity together. Um, and he allows Hindu and Muslim, um, Hindu temples and Muslim mosques, mosques to be built. And he rules with a centralized government with local governors called um, Zamin, Zamindars. I think that's how you say it. Uh, so all three of these empires are uh, going to be your gunpowder empires, which means that they're, um, they're producing that, okay? Um, and then to get back to this other question, hold on just a second. I got another question over here. I got to try to find, uh, where's it at? Okay, let's see, where's it at? Um, okay, Amanda says, remember Japan never got invaded. If there was an answer choice about that, just eliminated. They, that's true, but they, there were many who tried to invade them, okay? Um, Okay, and then uh, Chindera says, what's the difference between centralized and decentralized government? A centralized government is a political authority that governs an entire nation, okay? Whereas decentralized would be kind of like separated out in different places. So for example, the United States has a centralized government because we have Washington, D.C that our government in Washington, D.C. governs the whole nation. Decentralized would be if there were small little governments everywhere throughout a country, okay? Okay, uh, let's see, that is period three. Don't forget in period three, um, it's also the start of, no, that's not yet. Not yet. Okay, so period four. Moving on to period four. That's 1450 to 1750. This is going to be when we have the age of exploration. Um, we have China's exploration. We have European exploration. Remember, China doesn't really like continue their exploration past where they are because they pretty much have everything that they need. But Europe wants more resources, and so that's why Europe is going to continue their exploration outside of where they're at. We also have the scientific revolution. This makes exploration possible. So some words that you might want to remember for evidence would be like astrolabe. That's kind of like a uh, compass kind of. It's like a navigational tool that they use. Um, you could also talk about the compass and the woodblock printing. Remember the woodblock printing is going to make the Protestant Reformation possible because now we can print books faster. Um, so that woodblock printing, you know what? I have one. I'll have to go, you know, you know what? I'm getting ready to move. And so I just packed it. Um, but I'll have to do a video with it. It's pretty cool. They're basically these like wood blocks. And in order to print, you would put down each letter that you want to spell out a word. And then the ink would come down and press up against it, or you'd roll ink on top of it. And then you press it up against the paper. So that's what woodblock printing is. Uh, also, during this time period, we have the silver trade going on. Remember, that was the one that we listened to the podcast um, about the silver trade in South America. And then the Spanish would mine the silver, send it over to the Philippines, and then send it to China. And China was getting the silver that way. 
Um, and the Spanish used also the encomienda system. Encomienda, that was um, the one that they used when they set up plantations and used Native Americans for labor. Then we also have the Atlantic slave trade starting during this time. Remember, because Native Americans did not make really good slaves because they knew the land, so they were able to escape easier. They were also getting super sick because they didn't have immunity to diseases. Um, so another example of context, if you're talking about the context for uh, European exploration, you could discuss the Enlightenment and you could discuss the scientific revolution and talk about how um, the enlightenment thinkers are starting to think kind of outside the box and they're kind of getting people to do the same thing. Then the scientific revolution comes along and gives them the tools to be able to explore. So all of that could be context for um, exploration. Uh, Chindera says, why did the Muslim block routes? Not sure what you're talking about. Like block trade routes? Maybe explain that one a little bit for me because I'm not sure. Um, I would I would assume probably because of profit, but um, not quite sure what you're asking me there. Okay, so then uh, we have Protestant Reformation. Remember that starts with Martin Luther not being happy with the Catholic Church because of indulgences. Remember, they were paying indulgences to get rid of sin. And Martin Luther was like, nope, that's not biblical. And he wrote the 95 Thesis. We also have Christopher Columbus coming to the New World. Hernan Cortez coming. Um, and then, of course, uh, the labor systems that are important. important. You need to remember the slave trade, the words that go with that, middle passage, uh, triangular trade. Those are important um, evidence words. You could also talk about urbanization in Europe and how the enclosure movement happens where they start to enclose. Remember the wealthy farmers are buying up all the small farms and then the small farmers are like, well, we don't have any of our land anymore so now we have to go to the city. And so urbanization is happening because of that. We also have indentured servants. Also, remember, indentured servants are not slaves. It's not the same thing, okay? Indentured servants is like got a time limit on it. Usually, it's about seven years where someone was wanting to come over to the new world, and so someone else that was wealthier would pay for them to come, and then um, they would work for that someone else that paid for their passage for a certain number of years before they would earn their freedom. So it's not the same thing as slavery, don't get that confused. Um, also, another thing that some of my kids got confused last year is um, Afro-Eurasia. That means Africa, Europe, and Asia all combined. Okay, so if you see any big words like that and you're like, never seen it, I don't understand it, just break it apart and see what they're talking about. Okay. Okay. So moving on, um, we've got periods five. That starts in 1750. That's going to be when you see all the revolutions. Make sure you review those. Uh, we got opium wars. We have the Sepoy Rebellion. Remember, the Sepoy Rebellion happens in India because the um, Muslim people, they, they were requiring them to bite off the ends of the gunpowder to put the gunpowder in their guns. But the ends were greased with um, pig fat. And because they were Muslims, they couldn't have that in their mouths. And so they rebelled against that um, because the shell casings were encased in pork. Okay, let's see. Um, what key words should we look for? Words that signal specific periods or events in history. Definitely pay attention on your essays especially. If they're asking for similarities and differences or they're saying uh, compare and contrast, that's similarities and differences. If they talk about cause and effect or if they talk about change and continuity. Um, I've had some students that will write about a change in continuity when it's asking for similarities and differences. So pay attention to your prompts and what exactly they're asking for. Make sure you address that prompt. Also pay attention if they're asking you to address the image or tie your answer to an image or a primary document. That's super important. 
Don't forget on your LEQ to use words that will tell the reader if you're comparing or contrasting or if you're giving cause and effect or if you're giving change and continuity, okay? So like, for example, with similarities and differences, you wanna say both of them have this or similarly or um, you know, those words that, that, that show that, okay? So before you go to bed tonight, if you want to just look up a quick list, like look up a list of words that show cause and effect, look up a list of words that show similarities and differences, and just kind of read over that to review with yourself on how to write those. And then Isaac says, can you give tips for SAQs, for example, how they grade so you get the point? Well, I talked about SAQs at the beginning of this video, um, so as soon as I get it posted, you can go back and look at that, but basically for SAQ, you want to make sure that you're answering the prompt. It's super important. If they ask you to uh, refer to a document or refer to an image, make sure you tie that in with your answer. If you don't do that, you won't get the point, okay? SAQs are worth three points, and you label it A, B, C. If you get A, you get a point, B, you get a point, C, you get a point, okay? Um, so make sure that you are definitely tying it with any document that it gives you in the prompt, so you're answering the prompt, and use a topic sentence um, so that you remember what you're trying to prove, okay? Use as many keywords as you can, like vocab words. So for example, if your SAQ is about World War I, what kind of keywords can you use? Well, you can talk about militarism, you can talk about the advancements of technology and trench warfare, you know, all of these like keywords, as many vocab as you, vocab words as you can throw in there. That'll be good. Okay, so back to period five real quick. Um, we also have the Boxer Rebellion. That's a rebellion in China when the Confucian farmers um, went up against the Qing Dynasty. Um, we also have um, the Opium Wars. We have Japan trying to keep people out. And then the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration happens um, when America kind of forces their way into Japan and um, the Meiji uh, will create more of a centralized government in order to compete with the Americans. Um, oh, Berlin Conference and Imperialism is big in period five. Make sure you review that and look at that. Um, don't forget about the documents that go with your revolutions and the people that go with your revolutions. We also have Industrial Revolution. That's when it goes from cottage industry to more of factory. Okay, there are definite pauses and effects positive effects and um, negative effects with that. There could be an essay maybe on that. Um, we have socialism and communism. Make sure you understand those systems. And then for period six, there's a ton of stuff in period six as well. Um, that's 1900 to present. We have World War I, World War II. We have people like Stalin and Mao and totalitarianism. Um, fascism, we have the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, those two happen in China, okay? Uh, decolonization is a big one in period six, and don't forget about the Green Revolution, okay? Green Revolution happens near the end of period six when um, they're trying to in, um, make food, make growing food more efficient, okay? So anyway, if there was anything in this video that I mentioned that you're like, man, I really don't remember that, just look it up real quick, get a quick overview. The most important thing though that I want you to do tonight is get plenty of sleep. So don't stay up all night thinking that you're just gonna cram and that you'll do good on this test because you're gonna fall asleep, okay? <laughs> when you go to take the test tomorrow. So make sure that you're going to bed early, at least by 10, like try to be in bed by 10. Tomorrow morning, get up, get yourself a good breakfast so that you're not hungry and make sure you have pens and pencils ready to go and just do your best. That's that's all we're asking. That's all your teachers want you to do is your best. And um, we know that most of you have been working hard all year long to get ready for this exam. We're super proud of your hard work and I just wish you all the best. And I will be thinking of you guys when you're taking this exam tomorrow. And uh, I can't wait to have you come out and be like, hey, I know I rocked that test. So, um, Good job, guys, and I'm going to wrap this up. If you have any last-minute questions, just hop on there real quick and type them, but I'm going to wrap this live up because um, 
It's almost nine o'clock. I want to give you a little bit of chance to kind of review some things that we talked about tonight that maybe you forget and then head to bed. All right. Get plenty of sleep. And um, Patrick says, thank you so much. You've been so much help to me. Oh, thank you, Patrick. I really appreciate that. I'm glad that you, it has been helpful and uh, you are so welcome. I don't know how to say your name, Teria, Teria and company. You are so welcome. I totally love you guys and I just wish you all the best on this test tomorrow. Thank you, we'll do great. Yes, Sophia, I think that you'll do great. And you know what? I'm proud of you guys for all your hard work. So even if you get a one, I'm still proud of you as long as you were working hard and you guys are the dedicated ones. So I know you'll be fine. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'd even get through it if it weren't for you. Oh, thanks, Amanda. I really appreciate it. I love you guys so much. And um, I've just enjoyed working with you wholeheartedly this year. I thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting the YouTube channel. It just means the world to me. I really, really appreciate it. And um, with that being said, uh, I wish you all the best. I will be thinking of you guys tomorrow. Just do your best. Make sure and take a deep breath if you get stressed. And just try to remember what you've learned this year. You know a lot more than what you think you do. So hopefully it will just come out. Don't be stressed. Don't have anxiety about this. You've got it. Okay? You can do it. So thank you again for tuning in and listening tonight. I really appreciate it. And I will see you guys later. Have a good one.